Hi folks, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes um, <clears throat> setting up. So if you bear with us, we'll go through, through the setup and then we'll make a start uh, on the hour. Thank you for being here. Now you, can, you get a first front row seat to how it all happens. Hello Francis. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep, I hear you absolutely fine. Yep, you look great. The image is a lot better now. It was a little bit blurry before. That's fine. Yeah, I've, I've turned some lights on, so I think it might have worked. <laughs> Excellent, yes, that's great. Um, we've got this one that is fine, so the previous setting worked fine. Mm -hmm. um, shall we do that screen share we mentioned? Yeah, sounds good. Just a minute. Uh, yeah, can you see that okay? Uh, yes, I'll just bring it up. There. Um, if you, Perfect. And then... Yeah, that's fine. That's going through the, 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 um, uh, the tab. So that's absolutely yeah. fine. That's great. Perfect. I'll just stop sharing then. Uh, no, you can actually continue because... Uh, or, um, okay. Yeah, I can continue if you want. Um, yeah, continue sharing. See what happens. If not, if not, we'll we'll fix it later, and that's fine. That's okay. great. Yeah, because I'm going to change scene, so that should be absolutely fine. And then there's one more scene I've got to do, which is this one here, which is fine. And then there's that. And this. Fine. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Folks, thank you for this. We're just, um, we've just finalized um, setting up and um, we'll just wait uh, an another minute or so and uh, we'll make a start. Thank you for, so much for being here. I'll be back in a tick. Greetings. Welcome to the studio. We've got, um, got a few people. We're expecting about a few more. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, we'll, we'll wait a little while. There's a few more people turning up. That's great. By the way, um, what, um, what we've, Francis and I have discussed, um, what we'd like to do is We'd like to act rather than have a question time at the end. We'd actually like to incorporate your comments and questions as part of the conversation, so that we actually incorporate that as we as we go along. Um, so please feel free to 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 comment right and to ask questions as we go along, so that then we actually have the opportunity to weave those within part of the narrative. So in, 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 in effect, we are moving away from the idea of audience, uh, more moving towards something that is far more participatory, far more inclusive, in which, uh, uh, within the limitations of the technology, you actually participate as much as you can. So that would be absolutely great. Um, just to, to test things, could you give me a thumbs up, please? Let me know if you hear me loud and clear, if the sound is okay. Just indicate a thumbs up or okay and use your chat to do so. That would be absolutely brilliant. Um, just a couple of announcements before we kick off. Um, I'm delighted to announce that uh, from Sept on September, I'm not sure of a date at the moment, um, uh, New York photographer, um, New York street photographer Massimo uh, Gianchetti will be exhibiting work and will be hearing conversation with me. His work is very, very interesting in terms of using 
using particular techniques that are, in, on the one hand, very traditional, but on the other hand, very modern. His approach to, to photographing uh, borders one and the other. Uh, his themes are very, very interesting as well. Um, also, he, f he also follows that tradition of many American photographers, particularly street photographers, that were outsiders. Uh, Massimo is a European, he's a Florentine as a matter of fact, so um, I think it'll be really well, well worthwhile to actually view his work. Cool. Julie, hello, thank you, yes, I've got a thumbs up from Julie, that's great. John, John Webb, yes, that's excellent. Okay, sound is good. Cool. Okay. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, also, um, what I would like to do is open up the, the, the gallery, HF Studios, open it up to, to other photographers. So if you have a body of work that you'd like to, to show, that you'd like to exhibit, and you'd like to take, be a part of this, by all means, get in touch. Or if you know somebody that would actually like to, to, to exhibit, to show work, yeah, by all means, do get in touch, as I'm looking for people at the moment to be guest exhibitors uh, starting September onwards. So uh, there's plenty of opportunity there. Cool. Marion, loud and clear. That's great. For some reason, it's not showing the text. and I'm not quite sure why. It's just showing the speaker there. So there's a little glitch on this. The text isn't appearing. And uh, I can't fix that. I don't know how to do that. So we'll have to live with that for now. I'll have to read the questions out. Okay, cool. So without further ado, I'm delighted to, to introduce Francis um, Little who's a researcher, PhD researcher at Manchester University, who's looking at the context of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, within the museum. Now, this is a breakthrough. In terms of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, what we're looking at is a disruptive technology. Um, we've had disruptive technology since the, the World Wide Web, somewhere in 95, 96. And in a way, the NFTs are the latest iteration of that disruptive, techno disruptive technology. Digital technologies, since the, since the beginning, have had that, that, that effect of, of, of actually disrupting the status quo. And what NFTs are doing is actually disrupting the status quo of the value of art and how all of a sudden we have a new type of currency whether good or bad that is yet to see however it is quite revolutionary anyway enough about me without further ado folks let me introduce you to francis little francis so good to have you here this evening thank you so much for being here Oh, thank you, Harry. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, very lovely to have, you know, lots of people come and listen to me on a Friday evening as well. <laughs> it's very kind of them to Excellent. Uh, give their Friday away. <laughs> um, yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, tell us, um, how, um, how did you, maybe, maybe start from the beginning, how did you start researching NFTs? What, what drove you to, to, to NFTs? Well, it's a funny one, really. I started my research in September 2018. So mm -hmm. to give you context of kind of blockchain, this was kind of just at the end of the initial hype. Um, 2018 was a very exciting time. We had sort of just the start of non-fungible tokens. Um, they hadn't hit mainstream, but we had things like crypto kitties and stuff coming through and um, some money being made, quite a bull market in the crypto space and my supervisor and I were just starting to think well is there something there for museums uh people were starting to think about it for art already uh we have people like known origin and a few other exciting decentralized galleries kind of coming onto the scene um but in terms of my own research I had been just finishing up a master's at Manchester uh in arts management and I was really interested in kind of the open access policy debates in museums which is essentially about digital collections and making them openly available for people to use, reuse and share online. Um, 
So it seems quite funny in a way that I suddenly got into blockchain because it's all about commoditizing it. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of connections. Uh, we're really into, I was really interested in this idea of ownership and this idea of authenticity and this idea of authority as well. But looking at these ideas within the digital space and how can museums use digital collections to kind of challenge and disrupt these ideas. And open access was doing that with ownership very much so because it's making us think, well, why are museums holding on to control about these images? Why are they not letting people have them for free? And that was a kind of a similar idea of NFTs. It's well, what, what can we do with this idea of kind of digital ownership and this idea of digital property? Um, and so my own research now is actually, it's not really looking at the monetary aspect of NFTs. Mm. I'm really interested in looking at this idea of the NFT as some form of ownership or this form of property. And what can it do for museums and the questions that we have, particularly within kind of engaging with communities? Um, so yeah, that's where it kind of all started off really. I, I like to kind of joke Excellent. that I kind of fell into NFTs essentially. Um, I'm ashamed to say I didn't know a great deal about it before I started the PhD, but uh -huh. I, I do, definitely do know a bit more now. <laughs> Excellent, uh, that's great, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, because this is very recent, I noticed that uh, one of the, the, the museums in, in the north of England, I think, decided to mint its first NFTs. Yeah, that's right. The Whitworth, uh, which is in Manchester as well. And um, yeah, I sort of was helping them through that process. Um, there, Yeah, it's definitely catching people's eyes this year. 2021 has definitely been a bit of an NFT mania, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, it's funny because during, as I started my PhD, everyone was kind of forgetting about blockchain. And there was this sort of thing of like, what is this? Why are you bothering to research it? Um, but then this sort of like, I think the pandemic and a mixture with kind of people thinking about kind of digital auctions um, has really set people off and got really excited about NFTs and it's really gripped the museum sector in a whole new way. Um, so yeah, it was great to see the Whitworth kind of suddenly thinking, oh, what can we do with NFTs? And they've taken a great approach as well. It's kind of using it for fundraising, but the um, money raised through the NFTs will be put into a community fund. So it's about reinvesting that money into their local community as well, um, which I think is a really lovely approach because there's so much kind of speculative markets about NFTs and people don't, people think they're a scam, think they're just a way to make money quick. And um, I think with museums, it's important that they uh, think wisely about how they approach that money concept. Um, Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So you're there at the cutting edge when it all is happening here in the UK then? Yeah, very much so. I sort of, I, I think the NML was the first UK museum to mint a token, uh, possibly in the Western Hemisphere as well. I'm not sure. There's kind of, I don't like to say that too often because you just don't quite know what other projects are out there, but I'll certainly be the first person with a PhD in NFTs and museum practices anyway. Um, Excellent. Which is, yeah, it's been funny this year particularly as well, because everyone's sort of thinking, oh, what's an NFT? And I was like, well, this is what I've been doing for <laughs> the last two, three years. So it's been, yeah, it's been a really lovely way to finish the PhD off as well, just for the realization that it's a really cool technology. Absolutely. So how do you see the future of, 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 of NFTs, Francis? Well, that's a hard one. I think, right. It's, we're kind of in a phase right now where there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of money being thrown around for it as well. Mm -hmm. That won't last. I expect people will start claiming that NFTs are dead by the end of the year. But I think there is a sort of sense of long term approach to this. People are generally really interested in it. And even in 2018, there were museums looking at blockchain, but not NFTs. And I think the technology as a way to authenticate digital material will be something that will always be relevant for museums because mm. they always need this approach. They need to find a way to prove their own things and authenticate things online, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it comes to their digital collections. Um, so yeah, I think there is, there, is, there is a future for them. I don't know whether it's quite what we have at the moment, but I think we'll see kind of new art movements emerging from it. We've got an influx of amazing artists into the scene as well. 
Um, and it's giving a lot of people an opportunity to kind of showcase their work and kind of commoditize it without having to go through that gallery system mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If, if I've, I've been looking. I haven't minted my NFTs yet, so that's that's in the pipeline. So I'll be in, minting some of the NFTs from my uh, from of the images of my exhibition in in NFTs. But I've been looking at the amount, the volume of work, and the range of work that is out there on the different in the different marketplaces. Um, mm -hmm. And there are quite a few, and then they're, they're more come, they're more emerging, and it's absolutely striking. It's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is the other great thing is that there's so many different platforms and blockchains out there now as well. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just do it on uh, Ethereum, which is, tends to be the type of blockchain that we use to create the NFTs on. Um, but there's yeah a lot of platforms that are kind of enabling artists from different spheres of life to kind of have a go and again, yeah, make some money. But, and you know, it's people sort of, sort of like, I know that like Hikik Nunk is, uh, it was made by a Brazilian guy and it's really taken off in South America. And um, there's platforms as well that have really taken over Africa. And so it's, this has become a very much a global phenomenon as well. Mm -hmm. And that is also in a way showcased, I think in the art that we're starting to see as well. It's not, just this tendency to be very Western art as well. It's kind absolutely. of a huge array. Absolutely. It's exciting. Indeed, absolutely. Yeah. Folks, um, just a quick reminder, uh, please send in your, in your comments or questions so that we'll, we'll be able to weave them in, although they don't seem to be displaying properly when I bring them onto the screen. Let me just do another test. They don't seem to be displaying properly. They do display on my, on my monitor. Um, which is a shame that they don't display properly here, but hey-ho, I will be able to actually read them off anyway, so that'll be fine. So do send in your questions and, and comments, that will be great. Also, if you'd like to actually start uh, a conversation amongst yourselves in chat, that's also absolutely fine. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll retake that in, 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 as part of, of our dialogue, because this is what it's all about. Um, mm -hmm. As such, this is a forum. So yeah, you're very welcome to to participate. And of course, any any questions that you think might be stupid as well, please do put them down. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes Absolutely. to blockchain. It's yes. quite a complex yes. concept. So. Yes, we like stupid questions, basically. So <laughs> yes, definitely. No, it's very true. You're absolutely right, Francis. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, every questions are quite valid, <laughs> most definitely. Cool. So. Um, you had some material that you wanted to share. Would this be a good point to to do that? Or yeah, I'll um, so I'll give everyone a bit of a run through about what my research is essentially. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've been working with the National Museum of Liverpool uh, since, as I said, in twenty eighteen, in September twenty eighteen, mm -hmm. and um, we were looking at this idea of how could we use it within community engagement practices. So it's about working with communities and thinking about how can we use the NFT to represent their experience of objects, mm. um, as well as then kind of diversify the narratives that are told within museums. Um, so this kind of then formed this kind of online exhibition called Crypto Connections, and I'll quickly show you guys now. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I, do you want to bring up the share? Yes, I'll bring up the. The there we go. Uh, so you see, see that okay? Yep, that's um, fine. Crypto yeah, Connections. So that's it, yeah. So we developed this online exhibition called Crypto Connections and it was co-produced. So the objects you see in this exhibition were chosen by the participants that took part in our workshops. And we asked them to bring one uh, personal possession they owned and um, one choose one museum object from the NML's collection, again, kind of based on this idea of personal relationships and their personal connection to it. Um, so, for example, if you then click on a, uh, one of the images, you'll see that it comes up with a summary, and this summary was written by the participant that chose it. So it's about kind of this idea of looking at the objects through their eyes and kind of then putting their voices on show rather than being kind of the museum's voice, which is what it tends to be in the gallery space. <laughs> um, and we basically did this because we wanted to use this online expression as the basis of uh, minting NFTs. So we've created each of these objects have been turned into NFTs. Um, and we did this using a 
gallery called the Possession Gallery. Can you see the new tab? Yes, I can see the new tab, yeah, with the purple Perfect. top, yep. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So this is a decentralized gallery that we uh, especially devised for the, for the exhibition. And um, it's connected to the Ethereum blockchain via a smart contract. So that's just a type of, it's a kind of piece of code or program that we use to tokenize things. So we can use it to then mint and store tokens on a blockchain. And as you can see, each of the objects from the exhibition appear in this gallery. And they're actually owned by the participants. So they actually appear in the participants' uh, digital wallet. So when I minted it, we, we basically gifted a token to each of the tokens that represent their objects from the exhibition. Um, and we did this to, as a kind of, to kind of look at this idea of around control, because the museum now no longer owns these tokens that you see before you. They, are, they have no way of getting them back. Um, the participants can sell them if they wanted to, um, they could display them, they can do whatever with them. Um, so it's really bringing this idea of kind of what does it mean to own something in the digital space? And what does it truly mean to be part of something that is kind of have control over something online? Um, so these are the kind of questions that I was really interested in looking at doing um, my thesis. Um, yeah, I'll just stop sharing that now. But I thought good to show you a bit of kind of um, what I've been doing in a kind of visual sense as well. Because sometimes I think NFTs can be quite hard to understand and you know, particularly when you think, oh, what do they look like? Um, and you know, essentially they look like other JPEGs online. They're just simply uh, stored in a certain way that you can then authenticate them and prove your ownership of them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. We've got a question here. Let me just pull it up, see if it works. So no, it still doesn't display for some reason. Oh, um, just a second. Uh, it might be I might be able to change a setting here. There we are. There we go. It was it, it 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 wasn't the technology. It was it was it was Harry. <laughs> <laughs> poor poor as good. Okay, here. Apart from minting their own NFTs, how else do you see museums being involved with them? Well, I think first of all is, is collecting them, uh, and I know there's uh, uh, I can't remember the gallery in. Miami and there's uh, a place in uh, one of the galleries in LA as well I think are seriously looking into kind of how do you collect NFTs because they've become a movement in themselves crypto art and uh, it's very different from anything you see in terms of the digital arts uh, canon so to speak and um, so they are worth you know it's part of the kind of con contemporary collecting process so people are kind of looking at that um, I think as well, there could be a really interesting approach to touring. So, uh, for example, particularly when physical works can't be just, um, you know, shipped across the world, it's that thing of, well, can the NFT be some form of replacement of that and enable kind of other museums to have things on loan for a brief period of time, but it's also letting that kind of loan history be documented permanently on the blockchain as well, which I think could be really interesting. And kind of then collecting a kind of biography of that object and where it's been uh, from museum to museum. So I think that's just like a couple of ideas. Um, and in terms of my own research, I think uh, obviously looking at this from a community engagement aspect, I think it could be a really interesting way of kind of drawing people into museums and helping them feel a sense of belonging in, you know, with the collections as well, uh, because it's about kind of, again, as I say, diversifying the narratives of these objects through the NFT. Um, so, yeah, that's just a couple couple of ideas there. That's interesting. So if effectively, this is about a sharing of the wealth, the museum's wealth, isn't it? This is a redistribution of those assets, uh, cultural, now digital. And, and, and I think in a way, NFTs is part of this progress that we've seen since, well, since the 50s onwards, really, is the digitization of culture. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, yeah, it's completely about this idea of redistribution and this idea of democratization as well. Um, and it's really building on conversations that museums and galleries have been having for like the last 20 years about this idea of how do we bring communities in? How do we, because museums are so often kind of seen as floating above the community, 
So it's how can we bring ourselves back down onto the level of people who surround us, the audiences and the people that are part of us as well in our history. So, you know, and I think having been you know, able people to have their say potentially through mm. the use of ownership of NFTs could be a really interesting idea and really bring that whole idea of shared authority authority to a whole new level as well. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Absolutely. You mentioned earlier when you were screen sharing, you mentioned the contracts. Could you tell us a little bit more about the, the, the contract that goes with the NFT? Because I think that is a part that often people forget um, mm. when, when it's a key, key, key element of the NFT. And can I just say this? Contracts are part of daily life. They exist when you buy a bus ticket. When you buy a, a, a train ride, when you go and order, I don't know, your lunch in a restaurant. Contracts are part of day-to-day -day life and they're an integral part of, of the NFT, which in my opinion sometimes is overlooked, but overlook that at your peril. <laughs> Over to you, Francis. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the smart contract is just basically a way to, it is almost the NFT in itself. Um, I think I'm wondering whether actually perhaps we need to explain what a blockchain is properly and what an NFT is, because we've been talking about this, but perhaps not everyone knows. But obviously a blockchain is a, is a type of distributed ledger technology. So it's like a distributed database uh, which records every transaction that's taken place in that network. So what we exchange are kind of um, different types of tokens. So we have things called fungible tokens, uh, which are kind of like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. But, you know, something like a pound coin is a, is a fungible token in real life because it's a fungibility just means it's got the same value. So if we exchange pound coins with each other, uh, we haven't lost value just to exchange things. But a non-fungible token lets us store things which are kind of unique in value. And because of that, we need extra metadata because this is how it makes that token different from something else. And this is what the smart contract does. It lets us essentially apply metadata to tokens so that we can start making it unique. Um, so that's where the smart contract really plays its role. Uh, we also use it to add other information. So, for example, obviously you need things like the link to the image itself because, of course, we don't actually store the image onto a blockchain because that would be too large a size in terms of data. Um, instead, we store it on something like IPFS or we just use a URL link. So, for example, in my project, we used a URL link from the online exhibition. Um, you also can, if you're going to sell your token, you can embed uh, royalty schemes, which basically means that when the next person sells that token, the original person that minted it, aka the artist when it comes to digital art, then can reclaim some money from that sale. Because, of course, the art market is well known for kind of artists selling things at very low prices and it going up hugely in price and the artist gets none of that profit. So this is a way for that artist to retain kind of 10% equity, 12%. It tends, it varies uh, depending on plat platform and uh, are some artists want to keep 20% or 50%. Um, and that basically means they get money in the secondary and third market as well. Um, so that's kind of the really key aspect of smart contracts, really. They, they play such a crucial role in kind of the NFT market. Um, yeah, and they're essentially just kind of code. It's, it's as simple as that, really. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of encoded and it's auto automated as well. So obviously, when someone, if I exchange a token, that contract is set off by the transaction. So it will automatically then pay the artist. We don't have to go through that whole process of like, oh, I'll pay you now. It's, uh, that's automatically done with the contract. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by the secondary market, Francis? Could you explain that? Yeah, so that's just uh, the market after the primary market. So, you know, when I first make a piece of art and I sell it to a collector or the collector sells it, sells it at an auction, that is the primary market. And then once that next collector wants to sell it, that, that's just called the secondary market. That's just kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's, so the contract could actually go beyond the primary market into the secondary market and so on. Yeah, because it it's built into the NFT. Could you give examples of that, that, that contract that could actually survive? So there's for a, you, you mentioned a percentage that goes for, for the artist. What other things could be built in, in, in there? Um, 
Well, I yeah, anything really. It's it's kind of just metadata. Um, there's not much else you. I mean, mostly it's just information about the work. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's just as simple as kind of an agreement really between an artist and a buyer. It's it's just whatever you put into that, um, and just kind of yeah, creating the token. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. We've got a, a question from Nicola. Do you think museums will need to revise their policies to acquire NFT art? That's an interesting one. I think, um, well, there's been loads of really interesting discussions at the moment just about acquiring digital art, let alone NFTs. Um, and I think a lot of the work conversations that have been had around how do we collect digital things will obviously apply with NFTs as well. Um, but there'll be other really interesting kind of uh, ideas around. So how do you store an NFT um, and sort of who, because you store think, NFTs in wallets. Um, so it's about kind of then who owns the wallets, um, where do you keep the keys to that wallet? So it'll be kind of, there'll be some specific questions around NFTs, but most of the questions that users will need to look at in terms of policies uh, it's already been kind of discussed in terms of like digital digital materials, essentially. Um, yeah. Excellent. Folks, keep those questions and comments coming because it's, it's, it's really, really good. We really, we, we really depend on you on your participation. So do keep those questions and comments coming in, please. So, Francis, where shall we go from here? What would you like to cover? I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, well, you can tell us more about your NFTs. How? Uh, what are you planning to uh, mint them on? Uh, which works are you going to choose? Okay. Yes. Um, where I've um, where I've actually uh, what I've been thinking about is 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 precisely the contract. Hence the, 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 that question of my the contract. What to include in the contract for for my NFTs is the first thing. Um, what images to include. So I don't want to think of the contract as an afterthought. I want to put the contract first um, and then select the images. And how are those images going to be selected? So at the moment, what I'm thinking is in terms of a triptych, mm -hmm. that classical uh, Renaissance form of, 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 of showing images, you know, the, 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 a, a triptych. Um, and I'm looking at the file, the size of the file, the file size, and, and the contract that will actually include, in my case, is, is have um, a digital prints, um, hard copies of the digital material, but also include bonuses such as, um, since I give photography workshops, that's uh, my, my, my line of business, as well as having the studio, the online studio, what, I'm, what I'll be offering is days out to meet the artist, have a chat, but also go out on photography workshops in, in the landscape, in, because this is what the photographs are about. They were shot on Bodmin Moor, the landscape photographs, so that then it's an opportunity for uh, the buyer to actually experience firsthand the locations where the photographs were taken and the, the historical, you know, great historical importance. So yeah, that's what I'm I'm, I'm looking at the moment. So we'll see. But um, I'm, I'm almost there. So within the next few days, I would like to have it ready by by next week. And what I'm looking at is um, using um, OpenSea. Mm -hmm. to actually you go, go with them because some of the other marketplaces take a while to, 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 to get in there. Do they have to verify? You have to send the examples of work, uh, website, high-resolution images, um, social media streams, and so on and so forth. And that decision process can actually take a few weeks so I'd like to actually bypass that for the time being, go to open seas that is almost immediate, whilst I actually wait for the other sources. Um, Maker's Place is one of them. Known Origin is another. Rareable. Mm -hmm. I think one, some, some invite you, whereas some you have to apply. I can't remember offhand. Which yeah, which. It's, um, it raises a good point, actually, uh, is to kind of remind people that obviously blockchain is decentralized and pseudomized. So 
it does mean that the process for artists to actually get onto some of the decentralized galleries can be quite a long process because you have to prove you are a real person, you are a real artist, and you're not a scammer. Um, because we have this issue, which we call the garbage in, garbage out problem. And it essentially means that, um, you know, because anyone can mint anything on the blockchain. So I could take the Mona Lisa and tokenize it and claim that I own it. But we all know that I don't. But on blockchain, it would say I own that JPEG of Mona Lisa. So it's this sort of real issue that we're having about the process of authenticity within itself of blockchain, because as an authenticating technology, that anyone can use that technology. So there's this kind of, um, yeah, th there's no one to police it essentially, and there's no way of taking it off either. So that's why things like Rarible and Known Origin uh, and Foundation are all kind of almost invite only kind of platforms because they want to make sure the person behind that sort of facade online is actually a real artist. Um, which is why it's quite interesting, I find that they, they make you use social media quite often to uh, kind of display your work in order to kind of, again, to show that kind of progress of like, this is my work, this is me, uh, this is how many followers I have, like I am a legitimate person. Um, but yeah, it's, an, it's a real issue that we have with blockchain at the moment. Indeed, it's, it's, it's all to do with providence and authenticity, isn't it? In a virtual world, where in a virtual world, providence and authenticity is rather a rather slippery matter. It's, 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 it's not, quite, not quite there. So there are other, there, there are other ways to actually go, go around that. We have a couple more questions and comments here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. Marion, again, thank you. Um, I can clearly see some... I can clearly see some benefits to artists from this new technology, but I don't quite understand why this technology will draw communities into a closer relationship with the museum. Yeah, so that is, that's what we were kind of looking at in my project, essentially. It's, it's about, and it's about making NFTs that aren't just simply like pieces of artwork. It was actually about making this doing getting through going through this process for these participants um this kind of co-productive approach where they got to kind of um show their kind of personal relationship to these objects and then the nft becomes a kind of transfer of that personal value or that personal kind of attachment or interpretation of that object and i argue in my thesis that this then kind of brings a sense of belonging because it's about them being closer to the objects but also um they're having a kind of sense of guardianship over that token because it represents something that is kind of technically owned by the museum because the physical object hasn't changed hands but it's about having a digital version of it that they own because it has their personal interpretation interpretation or attachment to it um, and I think in terms of kind of particular communities with specific objects which are really meaningful to them, this could be a really interesting approach to kind of building that kind of relationship. And that's kind of where I'm coming from, rather than being just kind of a, a just a random NFT. It's, it's about kind of the process as well uh, and the meaning coming from that process rather than just like the NFT. Uh, the NFT is almost just kind of a way of remunerating people uh, for being part of that project uh, and kind of having that kind of opening up to uh, to us as well. Absolutely. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, 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 can I just add to that? Also, it's a, it's a way of engaging with new forms as well, I think. And I think that's the interesting thing. Um, really, we've reached with NFTs, and certainly, you correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of museums and how they use NFTs, they've only reached the starting line now. Mm -hmm. um, Very much so, yeah. so it's just the beginning of how this evolves. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see how the technology evolves. It's a bit of crystal ball gazing there. Another, yeah, so. absolutely, from John, John Webb. Uh, how would museums explain NFTs to the more technical challenged of us good question um yeah so also yeah so let me just kind of reiterate again so a non-fungible token is just a type of token that we store on this technology called blockchain and it's essentially a digital thing that we can own and we can use this technology 
as a proof of ownership because it's like a data a recorded database it records all this all these transactions and tokens are put into this database and it can't be changed so it means that we can basically start recording a provenance because every time it gets exchanged we know that it's changed hands um, in terms of museums it's a really hard one because of course a lot of people who go to or museum audiences generally on the you know are wouldn't really know that much about blockchain and it's something that i it was a massive challenge for me in my research um and we we approached it by actually playing a really fun activity called block exchange which you can find um on the design and informatics website which is by university of edinburgh and essentially it's a um kind of board game in a way you exchange kind of tokens which are kind of just paper cards uh, and you exchange them with lego bricks as cryptocurrency um, and you kind of build up kind of transactions on a lego base um, and i would recommend going to have a look at it it's it's really it's a really fun way of learning about it and i think in terms of trying to approach people who don't necessarily know much about technology in the first place Having something material and physical is much easier to understand because you can actually then start to grasp it and kind of be like, okay, well, that's if that goes on top of that, that's a next transaction. Um, so yeah, that's kind of I think the ways museums perhaps should approach it. Um, the other thing is obviously goes from like from my perspective, which is like I was looking at it from a personal relationship point of view. So I was looking at how we have a personal relationship to objects and then thinking about the token through that part that way so it's about starting from a an aspect that we know and understand and then trying to grow out of that and try and introduce this concept because it is really difficult to understand sometimes um but you'll get there it's it's really cool once you once you get it <laughs> yeah no absolutely i i think that um my view is that i think it's it's it becomes easier to to actually see the nft the non-fungible token as a digital asset as a digital thing, right? And that could be a file of some sort. That could be video, it could be a still image, it could be a GIF or a moving image, it could be sound. Um, it could be, for example, um, Tim Berners-Lee, a couple of weeks ago, sold the, uh, I think it was a GIF image of his text that he produced for the World Wide Web, the code, that the code of text he produced for the World Wide Web as a GIF image, and that was actually sold online, auctioned by one of the large auction companies, um, Sotheby's or Christie's, mm -hmm. and uh, that reached a very handsome price in, in terms of millions. Um, so there you have one example. Um, I think the other example is, uh, is Beeple, and I'm sure you can mm -hmm. you can talk more of people than than, than I can, Francis. Um, yeah, well, that's just so you probably did hear about that. It sort of really hit the news in March, mm -hmm. um, and he's essentially an artist who sold. Um, it was five thousand. Is it five thousand works? I can't yes. remember. But he he's not actually a crypto artist by trade. He really actually only came into it fairly recently. And he would post every day on Instagram an artwork he did that day. And he then put them together as a massive piece and sold that as one big JPEG as an NFT uh, at Christie's and sold it for $69 million. So he did pretty well out of it. Um, but yeah, the way to really think about NFTs is simply is that it's a file that you get to own and you can choose to exchange it. So it's really translating this whole, if we think about ownership for a second, um, you know, ownership is classed as a bundle of rights and that includes kind of the right to possess, the right to enjoy, uh, the right to exchange uh, and, you know, that, that sort of kind of concept. And the, the problem with online space is that you can't exchange things because you can't exclude people from it necessarily because of the just the way the internet works. You can easily copy and paste things, you can share things, things become abundant, the whole concept of exclusivity and digital scarcity is redundant. But what NFTs does is that it lets you kind of reclaim a sense of exclusivity. It doesn't completely stop it, you can't, you know, because people can still see it without, you know, you being able to stop them. But the point is, is that you can start to identify JPEGs as owned by someone. So it's that kind of concept of singularization in the online space. 
mm-hmm. uh, and a kind of idea of originality. And so then, yeah, you can own it and you can then exchange it and make money out of it or mm-hmm. exchange it for value because it is identifiable. Mm-hmm. I think I'd, li- I'd like to add, yes, absolutely, I agree with that. I'd also like to add that another way of seeing it um, I think it's, it's making this real, if you want, real or physical world analogy so that then it be, the digital becomes more, more kind of graspable, more understandable. Another way of seeing it would be think of cards, tokens, that are, that, or think of collectibles, things that people collect. Um, not that long ago, people collected cigarette packs, tickets. Um, autographed photographs of some, you know, superstar, whatever. Think of collectibles. Well, th- that collectible, whatever that might, that whatever that might be, that packet of something, that signed photograph of something, could now be digitized. So it's no longer the asset in the in the physical world, but it's a digital asset that then becomes a collectible. So you, you, you own that. And you have the, as Francis quite well explained, you have the provenance, who minted it, who created it, who owned it before, and so on. That, that, that's part of, 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 of the history. Marion, there's another question here. It seems to me that most of the people talking about NFTs right now are art industry insiders. Can you expand a bit more on the democratization element you've mentioned? Good question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the main concept of where blockchain kind of derives from is this kind of techno libertarian concept. It's kind of looking at how can we, because of course the first blockchain around was the Bitcoin blockchain, which comes with the Bitcoin cryptocurrency, which is a cryptocur- is a currency that is not manned by any government or central body. Uh, so it basically lets people use money uh, without that is unregulated and can be borderless. So you can exchange money across the world without any, well, you pay a fee to the miner who authenticates it, but you don't, uh, there is no one taking, you know, a 20% cut uh, when like there are, I'm trying to think uh, of the example of the for some foreign exchanges, but you know that it can be really expensive. So this is a way of kind of giving away of kind of democratizing art uh, for democratizing money in a way because it lets anyone exchange anything, and because you, you don't need a bank account, for example, you could set up a wallet. Um, so building on that, like the idea of democratizing the art market is that with NFTs, anyone can sign up to one of these platforms provided you can prove you're a legitimate artist um, and tokenize your work and sell your work because otherwise the only other way that artists could do this is through the traditional gallery system you know you have to get someone to support you and back you put you in their space uh, and it's a long process you have to know a lot of contacts I'm sure many of you are probably aware of this kind of the difficulties there are in the art market with that. Um, so NFTs is basically a way for artists to basically do this themselves. They can start kind of selling their work through the platform uh, and make money immediately as well because the money is immediately sent back to them because of the smart contract that we were talking about earlier. Uh, rather before, again, you know, you sell something at, um, you know, a, at a gallery and you might not see that money for months. So it's it's democratization in that respect. Um, of course, you know, not everything is completely democratic. There are a lot of issues still with blockchain in itself as being kind of, is it truly democratized? Um, and that's just because in practice, people start exploiting these things. Uh, and, you know, we've now getting to a point where there's a lot of galleries that are kind of monopolizing the space. Things like OpenSea and Rarible uh, which again, you know, if you can't, if you're on that waiting list trying to get on, we're kind of returning to the exact issue that we had in the first place. We've just translated it online. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of platforms that are still trying to be democratized and things like Hiccup Nook uh, is a really good example of that. Um, so I would recommend having it having explore online. Um, and, you know, there are kind of a lot of, a lot of platforms that you can do this with. 
Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, going back to Marion's question, yes, it is It is insiders. I think you're absolutely right in that comment. It is insiders mm -hmm. at the moment that know about that. Artist mm -hmm. practitioners and certainly cryptocurrency dealers. Uh, they're well in, they, they, they have a good, good understanding of, 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 of the technology, of NFT technology. But however, I think that will actually change. There was an interview done... Um, I saw on Discord the, the the chat room of one of the of one of the the, the, the marketplaces um, could have been known origin. They sent somebody to interview people in the street. Do you know what an NFT is? And every single person they interviewed had never heard of the of NFTs. It's not that they didn't know; they never heard of the thing. So yes, Marion, you you are quite right. However, that will that will change in 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 time. And I think um, certainly when you actually see the prices that some of these NFTs are reaching, they do make headline news. And, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 gradually that will I think that will actually filter filter through. Yeah, unfortunately, it's 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 the money that makes the headlines, and it's the same with any arts. You know, you know, people don't necessarily know about artists unless they make a lot of money and become very famous. Um, and yeah, to kind of go back to your point, Harry, yeah, it's it is true. Like it is, it's very easy to forget sometimes. Uh, that actually NFTs are not globally known. <laughs> and um, there was a point earlier this year, because I teach um, teach digital heritage normally at my uh, university, and uh, I, you know, I sort of introduced blockchain for one of the weeks. And, you know, not even then people didn't necessarily know. You know, there was a lot of people that didn't know what an NFT, what even blockchain was. And it's that sort of reminder, it's like, oh yeah, well actually even you know, students don't necessarily know, and it's because I sort of surround myself sometimes, and it becomes a bit of an echo chamber, uh, particularly on Twitter and places like that. You sort of think like, well, everyone must know about it because it's on the BBC, but it's you know, for a lot of people, it's just it's a random set of words, you know, and it doesn't mean anything more than that. Um, but as you say, I think it will change gradually, um, and I think there's some more interesting projects coming through, and people thinking of kind of different ways of using NFTs. Uh, and kind of trying to move away from the speculative market. And I think that will help drive people to this idea of these tokens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A comment from, 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 from Marion. That helps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. Um, yes, it's a, new, it's a new technology, a new disruptive technology. Um, that will take a while to actually take off. I mean, how long? Well, we don't know. It's 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 a bit of a, a, a guesswork. Um, but think of um, take your memory back to 1995. It's not that long ago. Um, would have you believed that um, the World Wide Web, as it was referred to then, would be able to actually have what we're having at this very moment? You know, online conferencing, with um, with with me being in, in Cornwall, um, Francis being in in in, the, in in Manchester. I take it mm -hmm. in Manchester. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If I remember correctly, John is from from somewhere in the states. And, 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 and we're dispersed. And uh, I think that, you know, just a few years, it's, 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 it's actually taken off. Um, so I think really what we're looking at is this, this idea of, the disru of a disruptive technology that then becomes the norm and is very much embedded into, into the everyday. Um, no, completely. It's, it's been sort of terms as sort of the, the fourth uh, sort of disruptive paradigm, I think. And it's funny, I was um, kind of reading back through some of the stuff I, I was writing in sort of 2018. You know, there was a really great article by a guy who, because of course blockchain started in, well, practically started in around 2008, 2009, because that's when the Bitcoin blockchain kind of started. Um, and he'd written this piece being like, it's been 10 years since blockchain kind of was developed, like, and no one's found a use for it. Like, will this ever happen? And it's just, it's quite funny because obviously now three years later, loads of people are talking about NFTs, loads of people are talking about blockchain. It's that suddenly actually has suddenly found a value. Um, and that's in just three years. And I do wonder, you know, what will happen in just, you know, a couple more years? What, where will we be? You know, and 
blockchain might have died out. People might have lost interest in it, but also we might not. We might, but there's so many new blockchains being developed um, with them being more efficient, uh, being more productive, and of course being more environmentally friendly as well. And um, that I think there's a kind of really interesting space for it. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's just sort of this short, short period, although 1995 is just a year before I was born. So it's been, it's been quite a long time. <laughs> it's, it's a lifetime in your, in, yeah. in your terms, absolutely. Yes, that's a, it's a very good way of actually correlating it, definitely. Yes, also again, with, with um, uh, taking, take, following the, from, from what you've just said, um, think of cryptocurrencies, uh, the emergence of cryptocurrencies, how um, governments are not quite sure how to actually deal with cryptocurrencies. Should they be taxable? Should they not? Um, mm. China, not that long ago, decided to, to put an end to all cryptocurrencies. That's it. <laughs> Banned. Um, whether that's going to continue or not, uh, we don't know. So uh, what, what you're looking at is an emerging, an, an emerging scenario that will actually kind of evolve and take place. Now, whether um, the, it actually keeps the kind of format that we have today, we don't know. It's very likely that it will change, it will evolve. But I think that, in my opinion, this is the digitization of culture is here to stay. I don't think we'll actually go 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 back. And I think that this this kind of approach in in terms of digitizing, um, commodifying, and using electronic technology is 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 on the up. Um, Definitely, yeah. And I think because I think digital art in itself is such an interesting space, uh, even without NFTs. Um, yeah. And it has been since the start of the internet. Net art is, I think, a really fun approach. And of course, it's doing what blockchain is now trying to do. It's that whole thing of they wanted to get away from the traditional gallery space by looking at new ways and using the internet in that kind of concept of democratization. Of course, the internet didn't become that, but again, and a bit, blockchain's probably going to be the same way, but it'd be interesting to see where people go again. You know, it's the same people. The digital artists then are still now looking at NFTs now. You know, things like, people like Further Film Gallery in London's a great example. They, um, you know, have done some amazing, really interesting stuff with net art and internet art, and are now at the forefront of looking at it with NFTs as well, and kind of governance structures with artists. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really exciting space uh, for you know a new canon of art potentially to form. Exactly, and 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 that's that's where that's a great point to actually bring this question. In. How do you see the galleries using NFTs in future? Well, we're already seeing Christie's and Sotheby's uh, really catch you know an auction houses kind of really take on with this uh, this idea. Mm -hmm. And um, we're seeing them, you know, get their own spaces in the metaverse, which is uh, basically virtual worlds that are run on blockchain. Um, and, you know, artists and galleries are buying and are showing their works, their NFTs in the metaverse. And I think this is going to be probably one of the things that are going to grow substantially in the next few years. Um, so if you don't know about metaverse, if you're interested in at digital art, Go have a look at places like Crypto Voxels, Decentraland, um, and a few other. There's a there's a whole book, host of them out there, and people buy uh, digital lands. They build a digital gallery space and they display their works there. Um, and I think this is potentially kind of the the future of it all. It's quite an exciting space, and I think more and more traditional galleries are going to move into that as well. If they're in at all interested in digital art, I think they'll need to have something in those spaces um but also it's kind of this funny thing of again as i was saying like you know this sort of artworks there because it's trying to move away from the traditional gallery space and actually what we're seeing at the moment is christie's and all these you know typical brands of the traditional gallery space are just moving into it anyway so it's kind of no matter how much you try and move away from the white cube the white cube finds you it's uh, it's kind of an interesting kind of um, yeah, constant kind of uh, catch up again. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, because 
if, if they're not careful, they're going to, to lose their breakfast, their, their lunch, <laughs> and their dinner. So, yeah, they have to keep up with things. Um, sign up to any of the large galleries, Sachi Art or, or Christie's or Sotheby's. Sign up to their newsletter. And certainly with, with Sachi, I follow them. Um, I get regular invites to the, to the Metaverse um, 3D uh, real world, if you want, um, displays. So it's, it's already there available. It's just knowing where to look. And I think I would advise people as well to, to go to places like Eventbrite and uh, do a search on NFT, crypto art, um, and see what you find out. There's many events taking place um, that, 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 and, and at different levels from, from crypto, from crypto looking at very, the very technical side of, of, of cryptocurrency to the more um, practitioner-based kind of resources, how to actually uh, create an NFT and blah, blah, blah. So it's very, but, but the, so that there's a range of, 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 of um, programs actually out there. You won't find this on mainstream media in a way you have to kind of dig around in, in, in other places. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a question here, John. Can you repeat the website that you're recommending? Oh, was that uh, the metaverses, I'm guessing? I was uh, crypto voxels. Uh, and there's also Decentraland as well, which uh, those are kind of the two two big ones. So it's crypto voxels, crypto voxels. So V O X E L. Um, okay. And if you just yeah, just search it, it will be the first thing that comes up. It, it, cool. It's a big one. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, maybe you could send me the links later, and I'll I'll include sure. them in 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 the recording on 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 YouTube. That would be great. Thank you. Sounds uh, great. Excellent. Um, another question. Uh, I may be missing something, but there's, but, but, sorry, I'll start again. I may be missing something, but is there any benefit to artists who work in three dimensions? Well, that's just, it's just because it's, a, it's another space to explore, really. And when you're using digital art, it's, it's a way you can kind of uh, depict your work quite easily. Um, but also just to, uh, just to kind of highlight as well is that a lot of artists have been using 3D virtual spaces since, you know, they started. You know, Second Knife has been a really popular space uh, for galleries and museums and particularly for artists who um, can't physically come to galleries very easily. So you get a people with a lot of um, people with disabilities uh, or have, you know, slight threshold fear of being able to go into a gallery space. Places like Second Life and, of course, now Crypto Voxels and other places um, are places they can just enter without having to leave leave their room. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's mm. one of the probably the main benefits. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, can I just add to, to that as well, uh, the, taking on board uh, Marion's uh, initial point? Where it where does this leave three D art? Um, I think three D art will have to evolve into something different. And um, when photography was invented, circa 1830s, there was a painter, classical paintings, uh, Delacroix, who said, from this day, when the, the announcement of photography was made, he said, from this day, painting is dead. Right? 18 something, 1830 something. Well, if you think of painting throughout the 20th century, it's probably the most exciting time for painting because look at all the, 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 the art movements that, that were generated from starting at the beginning of the 20th century with Dada, Impressionism, Fauvism, um, Hyperrealism, Cubism, I mean, you name it. <laughs> And just that's the view. So in, in a way from, I think, the 20th century, when really photography really takes off as a, as, as a new technology, painting is probably at its most exciting time. And I think that uh, with, with 3D art, again, I don't think um, digital, the digital paradigm will totally replace it. I think 3D, that 3D, 3D work will actually change and morph. In a, in a, and, and, and probably in a way that will, it will actually also use 
the digitization of, of, of assets as well, together with the physical object. Um, but at least that's, that, that's my two pennies worth. So, yeah, cool. Excellent. Well, Francis, thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. What, yeah, a, what an eye-opener. It's been excellent. Thank you so much. Also, thank you to, to, to all our guests. It's been fantastic. I think your questions have been really, really relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, one comment. Very persuasive analogy. <laughs> thank you, Marion. That's great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Francis, this has been marvellous. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, not at all. It's been a pleasure. And we'll definitely be in touch. And um, I would like to invite you again at some time, at some key point in the future, or if you have something new to, to tell us, I think that would be really, really good for, for you to come back. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to come back. That sounds great. Fantastic. From John, John Webb. Many thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you so much all for being here. To you. Francis, I'll say bye Thanks. for now, and we'll be in touch. Right. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Okay, that was wonderful. Um, Francis is so knowledgeable in, 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 in this area of, 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 of culture and art. Um, I think it's wonderful to actually have her perspective here. Um, yeah, I would recommend you to actually dabble, have a look at, at, at what, is, um, uh, what is available there in terms of NFTs, um, do your research, do some searches, some simple searches will actually provide very, very useful as a way of actually finding out more for yourself. So watch this space. Excellent. Now, uh, I'm just drawing to a close now. Um, I'd just like to remind you that our next speaker is next Monday, Jackie Nowakowski. She is a, an, an archaeologist, she's a top archaeologist, and she will be talking about the um, Bronze Age and Neolithic monuments in uh, Bodmin Moor and around Cornwall as well. So make sure you book your tickets for them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Good evening. Bye for now.